Hello and welcome to this newsletter video. My name's Barry Beckham. I'm going to begin with an advertisement. My apologies for doing this, but needs must. We're going to be doing just a little bit of work in Photoshop Camera Raw in a moment or two. But I wanted to make sure you're aware of my complete training set of tutorials for those who wish to use Photoshop. Photoshop for photographers is what it's called. I've got an introduction video to the whole set and an introduction video to each separate part. And just for the moment I'm going to open up the PDF to the complete set of tutorials. When the opening page appears on screen I can understand how reading through just the headings there may be quite daunting to some people. Over 80 videos in total with a total running time of 17 hours. But you must appreciate that you don't have to go through all of those 80 videos or sit in front of your PC for 17 hours to begin the learning process. Everything is in sections and it begins gently and as you get more towards the end then of course the videos become a little more in depth. There are seven parts to this set and I can just about squeeze them on screen. But if we take a look at part one, part one is completely free. Part one is setting up Photoshop to make it work efficiently for you. So all you need to do is read the PDF to see what we're going to do and download the free MP4. But you're talking here about a set of about 10 or 12 videos which are going to run for a couple of hours in total. But once again, just pick the ones that you feel are appropriate to you. Here I've just opened up the page on my website for part two. And as you can see on this screen, you can see an introduction video by just pressing play. You can watch it small on this page here, or you can then transfer to YouTube and watch it much larger. Download our part one, which we're offering completely free of charge, to give you an idea of exactly what you're going to see in all of the other parts. And I'm talking about the style of content, the size of the videos, and the quality of the videos, both sound and vision. How far you wish to go in the entire seven part set has to be a personal choice for each individual. But part one is free, as I've said. Try part two and see just how you get on. One thing to remember though, if you buy them as a set, they come at a cheaper price. So the advertisement's over, let's do a little bit of Photoshop work. We're looking at Adobe Bridge here. Normally we would see some more thumbnails than just this one, but I have singled this one out because it needs a little bit of work that I think Photoshop's Adobe Camera Raw can help us with. So I'm going to make a start by just quickly opening this up. This is Sydney. This is Circular Quay, and if you've never been there, a fabulous place. But you can see I've got a couple of problems here. A little bit of an exposure problem, but not much. But I've certainly got some leaning in of the buildings because I'm using a wide-angle lens to start with, and I'm looking upwards. So we've got two problems here. I've got quite a curve on the edge of that tall building and of course I've got the converging verticals, meaning everything is leaning in. And it really shouldn't be like that with a panoramic shot of the skyline like this. If we were standing at the base of those skyscrapers looking up, then that distortion we get as the building almost looks like it's falling over sometimes adds to the impact, but perhaps not here. I'm going to start by going to my lens corrections which is this icon here more or less central in that group up there and when I open it up the one that I want is this one here to enable profile corrections when I tick this box what's going to happen is Adobe Camera Raw is going to look at the metadata for this particular image from that it's going to discover what lens was used 
Once it knows what lens was used, it also knows how much known distortion is within that lens, because all lenses have some distortion, and it provides a profile down here. So when I tick, you'll see an instant snap. Let me do that again. There you can see the curve of the building on the right, and suddenly it's completely fixed. Yes, we've still got the converging verticals, but the curve has been fixed perfectly. Now you can see by the lens profile section that it has identified the make of the lens, the lens itself, 28 to 135, and it's provided the profile. If it doesn't do that, we can assist it by picking the make, and there's lots of them there, and we can assist it with the model and there's lots more there and of course if you chose Nikon as the make then all of these listed will be Nikon lenses and of course we can even pick the profile but I think most of the time with most lenses it's going to pick them up automatically from that metadata but supposing it doesn't now let me remove the tick just for a moment and I'm going to select the manual tab and in here I've got a manual distortion slider. It's quite obvious which way we need to go, but don't worry if you go the wrong way, it's going to be pretty evident and we can just move back the other way. And as you can see, I can straighten up that building and take away that distortion pretty much just with the eye. Yes, we have a little gap around the edge between the image and the canvas below, but we can deal with that in another part of Adobe Camera Raw. Just for the moment I'm going to double click that slider which will set it back to where it came from. I'm going to go back to my profile and tick the box and take us back to where we were a few moments ago. Because we've dealt successfully with the curve which the lens applied to the building but not the converging verticals. That tool has been moved. It used to live in this little section here on a third tab, but now we'll find it up on the top bar. And when I select it, you can see a lot of options appear here. And when we saw just a moment ago where I changed the barrel distortion and it showed that gap around the edge, well, I could have just filled in that gap with the scale slider here. Now there's lots of ways to correct converging verticals and once again there's some great automatic tools in amongst these but I want to draw your attention to this one because this is something new and it's appeared fairly recently. When we select it we get a little tip appear which is very useful. It says draw two or more guides to straighten horizontal and vertical lines. So if we say, well, let's click there and draw down and say, well, that part there should be straight. And let me say that this part here should be straight. As soon as I release my control, it applies the change. But it hasn't done such a wonderful job because I've actually put the wrong thing in there. I did that sort of deliberately. So what I'm going to do is hit the delete key to come away from that. We've still got the one on the right hand side, but I'm going to put one on this side, which is going to be much more effective. So I'm going to say that building also needs to be straight. So now you can see a much better job's been done. But once again, we do have a little bit of a gap left and right. Now, we've got a problem here. We can use the scale and we can put the, we can either just click and drag of course, but we can put the cursor into these boxes and use the up and down arrow keys and sometimes they're much more comfortable to use in some circumstances and you can see that when I lose all the edges around the edge of this image, I also lose the top corner of that building which is clearly not going to improve the picture that much. So on this particular occasion I'll go back to where we started because I think there's a better way of dealing with this. So for a moment I would be ignoring those two bits on the left and the right. I'll deal with those in Photoshop. The image does need just a little bit of work though so let me just quickly do that before we open it. 
I want to go back into my basic tab, but they're, they've all gone from Adobe Camera Raw. How do I get back to them? Well, I think one of the easiest ways is to go up to the top left of the screen and either touch the zoom tool or the hand tool. But easier than that, just hit the H key, which is the shortcut for the hand tool. And there you can see all of those options will reappear and I can pick my basic tab and decide what I wish to do. My image is very blue. We've got a couple of dominant buildings there which are blue. The sky is a good summer blue and of course we've got the water as well. So I want to increase the vibrance. I want to bring through some of the warm colours here. But of course I think I probably need a little bit more exposure first. Not much but just a little. And I'm going to push up the vibrance here. But the problem with that is quite obvious. It overdoes the blue. So in that scenario, what I could do is go to this option, my Hue, Saturation and Luminance sliders, select the saturation and drop the blues back down. So I've adjusted the colour up, but I'm now tempering just the blues. And while I'm here, I could say, well, what if I push up the yellows and the oranges? And you can see how that's put in a lot more colour into the base of my image and making it a lot more appealing. Well, at least that's what I hope. So for the moment, I'm going to open this up into Photoshop. You'll notice that the button says Open Object. I'm opening this up as a smart object because that setting is set in my defaults just for me personally. We'll probably remove that once we open the image. So I've opened this image up as what we call a smart object. What does that actually mean? Well if I go back to my layers for the moment, the thumbnail has got an unusual little symbol on the bottom right which tells us this is a smart object. I can double click this thumbnail and the thumbnail will open back up in the camera raw and I can make as many changes and as many different changes on top of changes as I wish because I'm not going to do any damage to the quality of my image because we're always drawing our changes from the original raw data. Now, in days gone by, there was a limit to what we could do when we were working on a smart object. And I think I'm right in saying that we couldn't distort the image using the transform tools, but we can now. So if I go to edit and I choose free transform, we get a bounding box around the outer edge of the image, but the crisscross across the center also tells me that we're working on a smart object. Because if it wasn't a smart object, you wouldn't have that crosshairs in the center. But what I can do now is simply drag the left and right out a little bit. And as long as it's not going to disturb or distort the image too much or mess up my composition, then it's acceptable and when I hit the tick on the options bar as you can see we get a pretty good result although I have missed a little tiny bit down on the bottom right but of course a touch of our clone tool or our healing brush would soon have that fixed. Now the spinning round of the screen has allowed me to reset my image back to just before we applied that free transform tool. I'm going to try another approach here using content aware. Content aware will read the pixels around this area and rebuild those areas for us. Now most of the time it does a great job. There are times when it fails but it's not very often. So it's going to be interesting to see how it copes here. Now if I go to my selection tools here. I'm going to pick up my polygonal lasso tool. I'm going to draw a selection down here so I'm just highlighting the area I want Photoshop to deal with for me. Now I need to fill that using content aware but when I go to edit and choose fill it's grayed out. So this is one of those functions that cannot be run on a smart object. So if I take you back to my layers, there you can see the symbol. So we just move to the right of the thumbnail, right click, and we rasterize the layer. We've just turned it back into a standard layer. With my selection still in place, if I go back to edit now, now I can get to my fill command, 
and there we've got content aware in the contents and we can click OK. I'll hit Control D and you can make your decision on if you feel that was a good repair or not. Now as you can see by the spinning round of the screen again I have zoomed in to that repair and if we were being absolutely super critical I think if we turned it on and off we would see the work it's done but I don't think anyone would ever notice that that repair had been done when we look at the image like this. So I'm going to have a go at doing the right hand side as well. If all fails then I've still got my transform tools to fall back on. So let's give it another try. There's the polygonal lasso. I'll keep this nice and tight so I'll just highlight in the area I want Photoshop to deal with. Once again edit, fill and I'll hit the enter key. Allow Photoshop to do its work. Hit the control D key to remove the selection and I don't think we'd have a great deal of a problem with that repair. Now just to bring this video to a close I'm going to pick up my zoom tool I'm going to zoom into the edge of the boat there and you can see some horrendous chromatic aberration around the light areas of that boat where it's isolated against the dark boat behind and that's been caused because when I took the image through Adobe Camera Raw we didn't apply the fix for that and what I've done mostly with this picture is to adjust the colors so I've made the chromatic aberration worse by adding the color I've added but what I'm going to do here is go back to bridge I'm going to open up the original image just before we made those changes I'll zoom in onto the same spot and there you can see the chromatic aberration. I'm going to take you back into the lens correction and there is the little option that we want. So if I tick that while you look at the chromatic aberration, what a job it's done. So whatever we want to do, Photoshop seems to provide the tools to do it. So whenever I open up an image into Adobe Camera Raw, I will always tick the box to remove chromatic aberration and for the vast majority of the time particularly when I'm using wide angle lenses I would tick the box to enable profile corrections. Now we can actually set these up so that we can apply them quickly and easily. If we always know that those two are going to be needed on every image we open and we'll soon realize if that was the case on what lenses we've got then we can go here and set up a preset. I can go down the bottom here, click, and here I can give it a title. So I could just say distort and that would tell me all I need to know. I could check none of those, but then I could say, OK, just apply lens profile corrections and chromatic aberration and click OK. So let's simulate the fact that I'm opening this image up from scratch. So I've just opened up this image straight from Bridge and I want to start working on it. I can go to my presets, I can just click my distort and the chromatic aberration and the distortion has been fixed instantly. In fact it's even easier than that. We can do this from Bridge if we want, not just with one image but with 50 if we wanted to. Here I'm looking at my original image in Bridge. It could be one of a dozen images. Let me simulate that by hitting Control C, Control V, Control V, Control V, Control V. So these images, let's say, were all different images, all shot in the city. This is the one that we've been doing our work on, so we'll ignore that. So when I come into Bridge, if I've got a batch of images, I can just select that batch pretty quickly and easily, right click, choose develop settings and there's my distort. And when I click it you'll see each of the thumbnails give a little jump 
as the chromatic aberration and a distortion is fixed before I even open the image. If you're looking for more tutorials like this, which are both informative and also creative, then come to www.beckhamdigital.com.au for Photoshop, Lightroom, Pictures to Exe and supporting programs.